to be exactly the same. <laughs> Successful. First of all, I would like to thank the students in the senior seminar in economics. I made them sit in the front here <laughs> for engaging in this topic and for welcoming the invited speakers. Thank you to all of the students, professors, staff, alumni, and community members who participate in various afternoon events this week and in the past and in the future too, right? Thank you, members of the technical crew and the physical plant staff who work hard to ensure the events go smoothly. And last, but most importantly, I would like to thank Ms. Jennifer Cordo, who annually plans and coordinates this complex event to perfection. If you attended the event on Wednesday by Queen Studio, you may remember he mentioned that one important element of building a vibrant community is to have a vibrant downtown. And one important element of having a vibrant downtown is to have great programming. Beloit does have very great programming, and can you guess who is the mastermind and master planner behind a lot of that programming? Jennifer. Yes, Jennifer. <laughs> but where is she? <laughs> there, oh, she's near the back. Can we just thank you, thank you Jen, for planning the Arctic Forum with me and for helping make Beloit a vibrant community. Dear students, colleagues, alumni, and friends, it is with great honor that I introduce this year's Upton Scholar, Professor John Ellis. He is the Kenneth C. Griffin Distinguished Service Professor in Economics at the University of Chicago. He received his PhD in Economics at the University of Wyoming, then became a professor at the University of Central Florida, then University of Arizona, then University of Maryland, and since 2005, he has been at the University of Chicago. Over the years, he has held so many distinguished positions that it's not really possible for me to list all of them. Um, but I would say that in addition to being in academia, John has also held various positions in the private sector. In particular, he was the chief economist at Uber and then lived in Walmart. Now, um, in terms of methodology, he is well known for his pioneering work in experimental methods, especially um, natural field experiments, but also other kinds of experiments. Now, in class, um, I tell my students that economists used to run only lab experiments. We did not run field experiments because it's too hard, too challenging, until pioneering people like John Lewis came around, and then suddenly it really opened our eyes to the possibilities. Um, yesterday, at the end of a class visit, a student said this to me, and I think he's somewhere in the audience here, that, wow, professor, this guy is everywhere. He's on every topic. That is true. In terms of research topics, um, his interests vary widely. He has done work in charitable giving, labor market, health, education, early childhood education, gender and racial issues, sports economics, and so on. I'm running out of breath saying it. <laughs> Um, and of course, his research is very, very impressive in terms of both quality and quantity. I asked my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Bob Elder, to look up his publication ranking because Bob is very into ranking. He knows all the ranking in the world, apparently. Um, and the result that Bob gave me is that John Lee's papers are the most frequently viewed of any economist in the world. that we have invited to campus. <laughs> but what makes John really special to us is not just his academic fame, but the fact that he's a Wisconsinite. He was born and grew up in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. He attended Sun Prairie High School and did his bachelor degree at the University of Wisconsin, Stephen Point, majoring in economics. 
And perhaps one reason why he accepted my invitation to come to speak at Boroit uh, is because of the many connections that we have with him. Um, he had come to Boroit the city, he had come to the Boroit the college to play golf, to play basketball. He had employed Boroit the graduate. Um, he is a friend since high school of Stockholm but over there. Um, who is an econ alum, now serving in the board of trustees for the college. Um, and so let me say this, what is our today? Please feel at home at Boloit, yes. I cannot wait to hear your talk, so please come. been a whirlwind. Uh, I feel like um, the last few days have been incredible on so many dimensions. Let me start by thanking people. Um, Zip, thank you very much. It has been incredible. This is a unique experience and I have thoroughly enjoyed this experience, not only getting to know you better, getting to know your colleagues better, uh, Laura's taking over, I know that. Good luck filling these <laughs> shoes. I know you're more than capable, but the job that was done here has just been remarkable. So I want to say thank you very much. I know this takes a ton of time, a ton of anxiety and angst, but can we please give her a hand? <laughs> Now we've sort of done this twice, right? Because we did it virtually with your class and we're going to go through it again with your class and talking about your designs, etc. We're not done after tonight. We still have a little bit more work to do. But um, look, what you're doing here in the classroom, what did I teach? I've probably taught five or six courses over the last few days, right? Uh, more than I think I've taught in like 10 years. Um, but I'll tell you what. The energy in the room and the energy that the students have been bringing to the classrooms that I have been in, it's been open and honest and everyone's trying to learn from each other. In the community that you have, not only with the people in your department, five people in your department, but the community, when I was walking, I went to the, the place three times, the new building, powerhouse three times. And each time I would see students who we would talk and we would say what we thought and it was an environment that is a family. That I think is the unique trait here. You not only have a bunch of really smart people, a bunch of great human capital, but it's a family and it's a community that you should be very proud of. I've never been at a university that had this kind of community. High Park's close, but it's scattered enough to where you don't have it. So you should be very proud of that and keep that. So Department of Economics, I want to say congratulations. It's a great department, and I'm very proud that so many students are coming through this group. Now, I also want to thank the people who have participated, because it's real time. I think I saw Quint here. Quint, I want to thank you for the talk on Wednesday night. It was very good. There was buzz around it the next day. And that's what you want. Um, you don't want to tell people what they think is true already. And they can just say, yeah, that's right. That's not how you roll. That's not how I roll. And I want to thank you for coming up here and doing this celebration with all of us. You have killed it in Pensacola. Guess what's next? Right here. Right here in Beloit, because if Quint can do in Beloit what he did in Pensacola, there will be foundational change, transformational change. The next night we had a great, great debate. Phil, I think you're here, right? <laughs> so it was great. Look, these are colleagues who are not economists and who are coming in to be part of an open debate, an investigation about what have we learned about science and questioning science. That's exactly what we should all be doing. And it broke out into a great debate between two Chicago guys, right? 
What better fun than that? And students were still talking about that. Several students came up to me today to talk to me about that debate. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Look, we're all trying to make the world a better place. We all think we have the secret sauce about what we think will work, what we don't think will work. It's great. Bring your ideas. Bring your ideas to the academic journals. Bring your ideas to the world. And we'll try them out. And we'll see what works. But the beautiful thing around here is we can openly debate and maybe disagree. Still go have a beer and talk about how we're going to change the world. That's what this should be about. Okay? Today, it was remarkably humbling when some of the, my own people came from my own nest. So the beautiful thing about the academy is you have the chance to just change, hopefully, or augment people's human capital. You have a chance, if you're lucky, to introduce the economic way of thinking, the economic way of doing research. So three of my PhD students and postdocs flew in to talk this afternoon about what they have been doing and about how they have been changing the world. And that's the unique aspect of the academy because you want to build up people and then when they go out and change the world, I get more satisfaction or what economists call utility out of them doing well than my own self doing well. You will all know what this means when you start to have kids. Because when you have kids, their utility becomes more important than your own utility. And when you start to have grad students, it feels the same way. So I'm really uh, humbled and honored that my folks could come back. And they're sitting right here in the middle, Sally and, and Alec. Thank you so much for coming. So let me stop here. And I want everybody to give a round of applause for all of the people who have given their time for this event. <laughs> and I want to thank you for choosing me for, for this, uh, this great ride for the three days. And the celebration will officially end tonight, but I think it will continue as we continue to work together. Okay. You can probably guess what's going to come next, right? I've been giving away these t-shirts all week, and you can see some people wearing them. I love that. You went changed and put it on. Um, love that. Love that. So I promised everyone we have one last shot to win some t-shirts. Now, I hope this experiment works. At the hotel, I tried it, and it was not working. So if it doesn't work, I'm going to call upon my PhD students, and we're going to do this thing by hand in the end, OK? So let's talk about the experiment, and then we'll start talking about the lecture after we do the experiment. This is what I call, let's get some neurons by it. OK, let's see if this thing will work. Yeah, Houston, we might have a problem. There we go. Was that you or me? Me, OK. Here's your chore. OK, there's going to be a QR code that you're going to take a picture of, and I'm going to have you fill out a survey in a few moments. But here's what I want you to think about doing. I want you to choose an integer between 1 and 100 that you think will be 2 thirds of this group's average guess. So look around. You're going to tell me what you think of the people around you. Put yourself in their shoes. And choose an integer. If you choose pi, that's clever, but it's going to get thrown out. If you choose negative 2 million, it's going to get thrown out. It's not in the set. OK? Now, all of you know that I'm an economist. And I understand that incentives matter. It's not always price, it's not always non-price, but there's a set of incentives that usually people uh, operate under or they have social norms, what have you, culture. That's what you're going to be bringing home tonight, the winner of this. And again, you know I have them in stock. They're right here. They sure would look good on a person, wouldn't they? Here's the problem with these t-shirts. You cannot get them in stores. 
Now that's a demand problem, not a supply problem. And nobody wants them. But I do have two of them. Okay? Now, what's kind of interesting is a past winner actually went on the Twitter and uh, tweeted this. I recently read the voltage effect, I'm called Econ for Everyone, and all of you who have met me understand what I, I believe Econ should be for everyone. And it taught me to successfully scale up from a glass to a bottle. <laughs> Thanks, John. I cannot be blamed for that. Okay, and if you win and when you win, you do not have to go on the Twitter and you do not have to go from a glass to a bottle, but that was Dan Henderson's way to scale what he learned. Dan Henderson is an econometrician at the University of Alabama. Okay. Everyone loves extra credit. Let's call it the bonus swag opportunity. I want you on that same form, there will be a line that says, what is a theoretical equilibrium to this game? Not the empirical equilibrium that you think will happen. That's what your first guess is, right? Two thirds of the group's average. But in theory, what does game theory or economics predict is the equilibrium. Now, if you don't speak economies, you might wonder, what does equilibrium mean? As we talked about this morning in the principles class, equilibrium means once everyone in the room chooses this number, no one has an incentive to change. That's equilibrium. Let's hope this works. Good luck. See, I'm praying. I'm praying. Somebody give me a thumbs up if they're getting the form. Yes! Oh my goodness. If it doesn't work for you right away, I urge you to get another angle. And in the bottom left, you can see a bunch of letters and numbers. Give it a go. Now, if you're here, you don't have to put your email address in there. Sometimes I do this talk virtually. It's not really this talk, it's a totally new talk tonight. But I, I ask you for email so I can send you a t-shirt. But go ahead and give it a go. Are you getting it? You get it blank. I know sometimes I'm blank too. But some people are getting it. Some people getting this? Yeah, walk around a little bit. Who got it? Ra raise your thumb. Okay, so a few people in the back are getting it, it looks like. So sometimes the light messes you up. Sometimes the glare of the light. Kate, did you get it? Yes, the beauty contest. We're going to talk about why this is called the beauty contest at the end of my talk. Big Al, you getting it? <laughs> to be determined. These acronyms by jokes. Yeah, so some people are getting it, some people aren't. It's frustrating, I apologize. It's something when I transferred it over to this file. So here's what I'm gonna do. If you can't get it, if you can get out a piece of paper and write down your name and your guess and the equilibrium guess, they're gonna go into Al and Sally and there's gonna be a hybrid that Al and Sally are gonna help us with because there's a guy at the University of Chicago who's gonna get these numbers and crunch the numbers. How many people have gotten it so far? Fair number. Okay, this is unusual. Usually, actually this has always worked every time I've tried it. But if you don't have it, get a piece of paper, get a pen, and write down your, uh, and Sal and Al, you're gonna be working. <laughs> you brought your brain. Yeah, name and then the two numbers. Two numbers. Yeah, sometimes the thing just stays blank, doesn't it? So some people are getting it, some people are This is 100% on me because I transferred these to a different slide deck. Professor, is your group going to get the equilibrium question? Yes? Working on it. Good. Dominant strategy. 
dominant strategy game. Dominant strategy equilibrium. I love this. This is great. You've done this before. Some people are still giving it a go. Are you able to get it? You got it. All right. So some people are getting it. Keep trying as you can. And if you want, on the bottom left, if you take that in, it will come up. The quote on the bottom left. If it won't, it should. Your ears has it. Some people have. <laughs> there are some neurons firing. I can see them. I love it. Give those to Sal now. If you have a piece of paper, please bring it to Sal and Al. I love it. I can't wait to see you two put this together with uh, online stuff. You might want to send it to uh, Charles Sheet. He's a guy who's doing it back in New Chicago. So if Charles gets them, then well, however you think it's best, it's most efficient. All right, I'm going to give you about two more minutes and I have to get to work. So I have about an hour, I would say, that I want to talk about machine learning, AI, field experiments, and scaling. Two thirds of the group's average guess. are coming in. By the way, this is a real experiment. And this is not the first time that you have been part of one of my experiments, I'll promise you. <laughs> He's turning one in. He's throwing up that. Wow. It's like in Chicago, vote early, vote often. <laughs> he did three entries online, he's doing three and the handheld. <laughs> I love it. Welcome to the show. The incentives really do matter. I mean, this, look. It would go with your eyes. It would go with your eyes. Those are the eyes. That's good luck for you, right? Yeah, no, I think it's important. Laura, that's the thing. You have to make sure that Joel comes with t-shirts, because that's been my big winner all week. Tell him to write a popular book and get t-shirts. And then he's, uh, the whole stage is set. You have to give stuff away. You understand that as an economist and scientist. Okay, one more minute game, okay? One more minute. One more minute. You guys going for it? You guys settled in on the equilibrium? You got it? Signals of equilibrium. What made you do that? Edward signals of equilibrium. The first one's a guess, right? The second one's Do you think everyone's going to answer right? So there's no idea to ask right? Everyone answered right. Tell me what you think about it. I'm going to talk to you later at the end, okay? Because group's going to really love you for that guess. All right, gang. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, another job well done. Thank you so much for doing that. And now I see the Brain Trust is working. There's a person back at the University of Chicago who's working. And we will announce at the end of the lecture the two winners. And then everyone else with a t-shirt, I would love to have us all come up here and take a picture together, and then I'm going to post it on Twitter. So, hey, Stover, guess what the 
my big tweet was in the last two weeks, guess what my best one has been? Pepper. Mark. Pepper. Pepper. Pepper tore up the voltage effect, and I was sent some pictures. There have been 83 uh, reads of that tweet that I tweeted this morning of you and Pepper and Beloit. That's pretty fun, right? She'll appreciate that. Pepper is Stouffer's dog, who uh, ate, his, ate his book, The Voltage Effect, and I think, I think it was because the dog thought it was rubbish, and it was just gonna put it in its rightful place. But my friend Stouffer said, well, maybe it was because I was spending so much time with it, and the dog was getting jealous of the attention. Which Laura says, yeah, right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, very good. So here's what I'm gonna talk about today. So I was asked to do something different than the book talk. So I've been doing book talks all over, so we changed it up. So we thought it might make some sense to talk about AI and behavioral economics, this chief economist in a day. Okay, so here's how I want to think about tonight. The first example I want to talk about is Uber apologies. We will start this research with ML, we will then go to a field experiment, we will then go back to ML to design some products for Uber. I then want to talk about Lyft as a timekeeper. This example will start with ML, go to a field experiment, and will also lead to several new products at Lyft. And that will be around the value of time. Then I'm going to talk about ML in scale. This is where we're going to enter the voltage effect world. And how we can use ML to help us think about which ideas should be scaled, which ideas should be, let's say, revised and resubmitted for scaling. Now together, these three examples will highlight how economists have been thinking about AI and how economists have been using machine learning. These three chores will first of all be treatment effect identification. And the economists know that this is our old game that we always try to play. Really, this is trying to estimate what is the effect of an intervention. Does the drug work or not? That's a treatment effect. I'll also talk about using ML as an architectural nudge to make people better off. I'll also then talk about detection of heterogeneity. These have been the three workhorses of how economists in particular have made use of ML and AI. Okay? Let's start here. Please raise your hand if you have used Uber or Lyft in the last five years. Please raise your hand. Okay, several people, a lot of people. How many of you have had a bad trip on Uber or Lyft? Who wants to tell us their story? Go ahead. Uh, What's your name? Thank you for sharing that uh, traumatic experience. Smell, uh, speed, high speed, thank you very much. Wait, what are you two pointing at? Her laughing. Uh, her laughing thinking it's funny. If you've taken an upper and lift trip, you've had some bad ones. Let me tell you about my bad trip. So I got picked up at my home in Hyde Park. 
And this was in Jan early January of 2017. And I was going down town for what's called the American Economic Association meetings to be in probably the biggest debate of my life. It was nothing like the debate last night. <laughs> but it was the biggest debate of my life up to that point with a guy named Angus Deaton. So Angus is a development economist who really, really dislikes field experiments. OK. Angus won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. OK, so I get in the Uber. And as usual, I have not completed all of my slides. Right? You just know I just completed these slides like an hour ago or two hours ago. That's just how I operate. It's a bad, really bad characteristic or trait feature to have. So I'm in the Uber going downtown from Hyde Park to the big hotels where the AA meetings are. I'm typing away, finishing my slides. I look up, I see the buildings, look down. I'm, in, I'm on stage in about 17 minutes. Uh, in fact, Jim Heckman was the organizer of it, who was one of the, the Upton scholars. He organized it, and he was the moderator between Angus and, and John and me. So look up. Here we go. I'm getting ready. This is going to be so fun. Um, I go back to tapping away. About 15 minutes later, I look up. I'm back in front of my house in Hyde Park. I look up, I look down at the driver, and I said, no, what are you doing? The driver said, the app blinked, and you were just working, I didn't want to bother you. I thought you put in that you forgot something at home, so you had to go back, pick up something, and go back downtown. I said, no, get me there. And if any of you were there, some of you may have been there, you might remember I ran in from the back sprinted in with my slide deck, and, and we took, yeah, I'd say we took care of business, but it was still very, very disheartening that that angst and anxiety happened right before the biggest moment of my life. So that night I got home, and the occasional times when I'm upset, I walk up to our garage, and I make a phone call. I did it this time. I walked out and I called Travis Kalanick. Travis Kalanick, at the time, was the CEO of Uber. He's a founder of Uber. I was the chief economist at Uber at this time. So I gave TK a call. TK picks up, and I said, Travis, I want to tell you what I think about your blankety blank blank app. And you know where you can put that blankety blank app? Right up your lift blank. <laughs> I'm never going to take your service again. John, what happened? What happened? I told him. You know what, Travis? The worst part is I never received an apology. He said, we haven't gotten to that yet. He said, we have now. OK. When you have an idea in a firm, your first job is to make the business use case. It's like obvious, right? Well, have fewer bad trips. A bad trip can be a smelly car, bad music, a guy driving 100 miles an hour, right? ETAs are bad, pickup time, bad. A lot, of, a lot of different ways. Mine was one special time that my time to delivery took longer than expected. OK. Now, the business use case is sort of interesting because at once, you know my first thought. I want to do an experiment on bad trips. How will that work? You can't just randomly give people bad trips. That's bad business. So what I needed to do is I needed to find in the wealth of data at Uber, I needed to find statistical twins. Data that looked like it was generated by an experiment. In our literature, it's called a natural experiment, something that naturally happens in the data that you can at least be quasi-confident that it looks like randomization. So here's one example. 
we could look at two writers. I've changed the names, although the features are the same. Let's call them Sally and Jane. They both have three trips last month, three Uber trips. That's in our data. Their origin is South Chicago. They're going to O'Hare. Sally is picked up at 115, Jane at 125. Sally goes the northern route, Jane the southern route. And what happens is, of course, Jane arrives 20 minutes after our promise. Sally arrives five minutes before. That's a feature in the data. And then I can look at, well, how much did they spend over the next 90 days? Well, as it turns out, Sally, business as usual, five Uber trips, she spent $115. Jane, I've had it, these guys. Done. That's one example. That's an N of one. But guess what? Uber's pretty big. And when you do millions and millions of rides per day, you have a lot of bad trips. I get the business cases have fewer bad trips, but just nature sometimes determines a bad trip. So what we did is we looked at thousands and thousands of such pairs, statistical twins. And we did the analysis. And we looked at how much revenue are these bad trips costing Uber? What would you guess? Is it, will it be statistic? As they say out in Silicon Valley? What do we think? It's going to be tiny, small, big, large. What's our intuition? 10%. 10%? That's a lot, right? 10% of Uber revenue is Uber money. Right? It is a lot of money. It's between 5 and 10%. Because of bad trips, and this is just a few cities, Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Dallas. Across these cities, I can put up any city. It's about 5 to 10%. It's real money. Just look at Uber's balance sheet. It's real money. So now the idea is, I just used machine learning to make a business use case. Big data, machine learning algo. And I've determined we need to do something about this if you think 5 or 10% is a lot of money. And remember, a lot of angst for customers too which I haven't even measured here, have I? I had a lot of anxious times when I was going down for my debate. That should be included in a welfare calculation too. Consumers are a lot worse off, and they use Uber a lot less. Okay. So now our idea was we want to begin with a theory, and this came up today. So the way I think about problems is I first want some kind of theory. We turn to psychology. And we looked for theories about apologies. And I took on a co-author named Ben Hall, who's at Vassar College, apologies, and the wording of apologies, et cetera, et cetera. So Ben came and joined my team at Uber, and we started to design a field experiment. Now, after we design that field experiment, we're going to try to create a product that can work to make Uber better off and customers feel better. Okay. So here's the experiment. What we found in pilots is you have to apologize within an hour of a bad trip. If you don't, we could not find an effect. Okay. Our vehicle, after a bad trip within an hour, we sent an email from the company. Okay, this wasn't a personal email from the driver. It was an email from Uber. That was our first attempt. Now, you can imagine right away that I'm going to have a compliance problem. Yes, I am. Only a third of Uber emails are open. Okay, so keep that in mind when I talk about these results. I'm talking about a program whereby I'm putting people in treatment who I know two-thirds are never taking the pill. But I'm counting them as taking the pill. Okay, intent to treat, whole program. So you can see you have this email. This first one is the basic apology. Oh no, your trip took longer than estimated. Every minute matters. This is the body. 
And then here you can see, enjoy $5 off your next trip. So that's an apology with a promo of $5. So we're going to call this kind of treatment. All of this here, all of what that looks like, all of this, that's part of the architecture. That's part of what ML and AI can help you optimize for customers and for firms. Okay? The status apology looked like this. Just replace that up there, this body down here. Some people receive this one, some people receive this one, some people receive this commitment apology. Okay? And what I won't talk about today is we also have what happens if you apologize too much in our data? What do you think? Can you apologize too much? Yes. If you apologize three times in a month, it will be worse than never apologizing at all in the data. Okay, we have different theories for that, which we won't have to worry about today. Okay, so we run this. We run this with a lot of people. 187,000 in the control, 448. I'm just uh, pulling all the apologies here. Just promo, 186,000. Promo and apology, 437,000. Okay, so how to beat this figure? In the control group, after you've received a bad trip, the average person in the next seven days spends about 45.40. Okay. If we send them an apology, they spend about 45.90. We get back about 2 or 3% of what you lose from simply sending an apology within an hour. Remember, only a third are opening them up. Okay. Just sending them a promo, a well-timed promo. Hey, here's $5 off your next trip. Not even mentioning the bad trip. That works too. That's the best time to send a promo, what we find in our data, after somebody has a bad experience. The promo and apology, you can see, is about the same. Okay. Now, after doing this, we have to start exploring what are the best ways to send apologies and who to send them to. We'll get to that when we get to scaling. Because now we have an idea that's worked in the Petri dish. The question is, how do we scale that? Should we scale that? Who should we scale it to? Okay. ML scoreboard here is ML for treatment effect identification. That's the Sally and Jane. We have architectural nudges and we have heterogeneity, which is going to be coming. Okay. The three uses of ML and AI in this particular case. Value of time. I would love to stand up here and give you another cute story about this. Like with tipping, and I'll talk later about how tipping started on Uber. This is simply out of scientific and policy interest. Okay, and it's out of scientific and policy interest because it is really interesting. When you look at government policy making, how they think about time. You might not know this, but every proposed rulemaking that is economically significant. Now, what do I mean by economically significant? It has either $150 million in annual benefits or annual costs. Every proposed rulemaking in D.C. that is economically significant has to undergo a formal benefit cost test. When I worked in the White House, I worked on about 70 to 90 of these in a year. A lot of these policies have time savings. Think about them, a new bridge, HOV lane, infrastructure, internet. A lot of our policies have to put a value on people's time. What the federal government uses right now is they use a third to a half of the wage rate. I'm, just, I'm not telling you make it a normative statement. I'm just telling you what they do. That's $9 to $14 per hour. That's what they use for these projects. So when you think about, well, congestion, climate taxes, the value of public transit came up Wednesday night, 
you have to have a value of time savings. And that's the number the government's using to determine whether that's a good rulemaking. Guess where they get that number from? Where'd that number come from? Nine to fourteen dollars per hour. It comes, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Is it minimum wage? No, not exactly. It comes from surveys. It comes from contingent valuation surveys asking people, how much do you value your time? It does not come from revealed market behavior. Okay, so that's our opening now. So our background is, remember at Lyft now, we're moving from Uber to Lyft. We can talk about that story in the Q&A. As chief economist at Lyft, I realized, you know, every time you open the app and say, well, I want to go to Janesville, or I want to go to Rockford, or I want to go to O'Hare, what you're given is a price quote and a time quote. And then you decide whether to take the trip. That's called a conversion, okay? So right now, they look at what's called a reduced form relationship. They look at correlations in the data. It's not causal. Correlations to try to decide on dispatch and the incentives on both sides of the market. That's how it's done when I arrived at Lyft. So we started to think, well, maybe you could run field experiments and you can exogenously change prices and ETAs. Because you know which car you get right now? You get the closest car. And then they determine price by a, uh, a factor that I can't talk about. But let's say there's a black ML box. So there's a black box that's determining the price. And it depends on demand and supply features and expectations of those. So we started thinking about changing prices, ETAs, and, and uh, ETAs and prices and figuring out when you make exogenous variation, how do people respond? Now what's kind of interesting is this is an experiment now that gives you either the closest, the second closest, or third closest car, and then gives you a reduction in price for, take, for waiting more, more time. And economic theory has a really interesting prediction here. It's called, if you assume weak complementarity. What that means is, you don't care about ETA or price that you see if there's no way you're gonna take the trip. It seems like a plausible assumption here. I don't really care, if I'm never gonna take the trip, I don't care about what the price quote is, or the time quote. If you assume that, what's super interesting is economic theory delivers, if you explore or measure these two elasticities, in economics, it's called the price elasticity of demand, which is how sensitive are people to prices, and the time elasticity, how sensitive are people to time changes. The ratio of those gives you a value of time estimate. That's pretty cool. Now I have an experiment, and I can determine how people trade off time and money. So we did that in this nationwide field experiment, and what we find is something super interesting. Our estimate of value of time is $19.40. Much, much larger than the US federal government uses for value of time. If our estimate is correct, we should be doing a lot more infrastructural programs. We should be doing a lot more programs that save people's time. Okay? Now, there's a lot of heterogeneity here. You can use machine learning to explore heterogeneity, and it's interesting because economic theory has predictions about where the heterogeneity should be. And economic theory got it correct every time. For example, in peak commuting times, there's a higher VOT. Higher income areas have higher VOT. Time is a notable good. In locations with more outside options, higher VOT. Ride sharing, business accounts. I'm willing to pay the extra money to save some time. Somebody else is paying for it. Higher VOT. 
Each of those features gives us an insight about how the value of time will change across people and across situations. That's what we need for policy making because our different policies affect time savings across people and across situations. What's interesting and I still can't explain is the value of time actually has a convex relationship in wait time. So what that means is the marginal unit from say 30 minutes to 31 minutes is much greater than the difference between five and six minutes. That's what a convex relationship in wait time. I don't have good intuition for that. But nevertheless, that jumps out in our data. Now from that, of course, there's an academic paper. It's titled Value of Time Across the United States. So you can go ahead and take a look at that. But what's kind of interesting is some new products jump out from that. Have any of you ever used Wait and Save? Came from that. How about Walk and Save? Came from that. How about Fast Pass? Came from that. Now, these are then are new products that we can use field experiments in ML to refine and make people's lives better with a better product space. Okay, so we get to this point of, John, there are a lot of policies, there are a lot of ideas. How should we think about scaling? Should Uber and Lyft scale those ideas? What about in general, about a policy or an idea? What is the science behind the expectations that we should scale an idea that looks good in the Petri dish? When I first started thinking about the problem of scaling, I started to think back through my career about where the idea of scaling arose. Nearly every question we talked about in the White House had a background of, it might work in New Jersey, won't work in LA. It was about scaling. When I thought about it, Uber and Lyft, the two examples, or now Walmart, there are all kinds of ideas. But we think about which ones should we scale. When I talk about other firms or governments that I've worked with, we have a lot of great ideas in the Petri dish. How do we decide which ideas to scale? That, to me, is the missing link in social sciences. We have solved a lot of problems in the Petri dish. But we have not solved a lot of problems that can predictably go from the Petri dish to the large and help people's lives. Because we've been worried about the Petri dish, not the large. I started looking at this literature back in 2015. This is what I felt the literature looked like in terms of scaling. You have a bunch of great stuff, then a miracle occurs. What does that miracle look like? Move fast to break things. Throw spaghetti against the wall, whatever sticks, cook it. Fake it till you make it. That's art, but that's gut feeling. That's what governments use and many firms use to decide what to scale. We, sh we can love art, but we should insist upon our government officials having science when they decide on which ideas and which policies to scale. We shouldn't rely on, it's just a gut feeling. It will work. So what we did is we started working a lot on scaling papers for academic journals. Probably have written out two dozen scaling academic papers. Has anyone in the room, and be totally honest, you're not going to hurt my feelings, has anyone in the room read one of my academic papers on scaling? Not a book, have read an actual paper. If you raise your hand, I'm going to call you and you're going to tell me what you learned in that paper. Al, <laughs> which paper did you read? Uh, I remember the AER, P, and P one, the clearest. Okay, so what can, how can we learn from experimental results at scale? I've asked this question probably to 100,000 people, and now four have raised their hand. We write academic papers, and we are lucky if two people read them. The editor and one of the three referees. <laughs> <laughs> then we're in business. Come on. It's not changing the world. It's changing nothing. 
<laughs> but you're responding to the incentives of the academy that say you need to work on academic research and publish in the top journals and get a bunch of downloads. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that, but have I changed something? Or am I just misguiding policymakers by telling them, look, I have this great check program, the great Chicago Heights, and not giving them advice about whether it can scale? That was coming up right around the same time. We should be asking and answering the correct questions to change the world, not the correct questions to get another pub and publish in the AER or the JPE or wherever. That's an academic game. And I get that because you're responding to incentives. And you're trying to get tenure. That's great. But also think about asking and answering the questions that can truly help policymakers and businesses. And that's not creating a souped up program that works in a petri dish. That's a good start, but it's only a start. It can't end there. So I didn't write the book because of that. I wrote the book to give those ideas in those academic papers a shot. I wanted to write the book so my father, who's a truck driver, could read it and understand it. That's my audience the voltage effect. I wanted those ideas to not have the economic jargon, what I call economies, not have the math, not have the Greek symbols. Strip all of that away and translate what I've learned in academic journals for everyone in the room. We need more translators. Too many times we have deep secrets that are great in every field, not just economics, that we don't translate. And then they stay in academic journals. And we never learn about them. <coughs> Let's talk about what I learned in the book and talked about in the book. It's laws of scaling. In economics and in the social sciences, we don't have cool laws like the hard sciences have. Right? They have great quantitative laws. We don't have that. We're dealing with humans. When you deal with humans, you have to do, well, here's our law, and it's qualitative, and it works most of the time. The law of demand, it works until it doesn't. Al talked about the law of supply until labor, until labor supply curve sloped downwards because of income targeting. Those are our laws. Okay, I'll live with that. Okay, that's because you're dealing with people. So the first law that I talk about in the book is what I call the voltage effect. The voltage effect is every time the effect sizes, the benefit cost profile that you observe in the Petri dish, it changes every time you scale. Every time. Are there any engineers in the room? Guess what engineers are thinking right now when they see voltage effect? They're thinking this doesn't know anything. This is talking about wattage, not voltage. Be honest, nobody's going to buy a book called The Wattage Effect, right? <laughs> so, so give me some artistic liberty here. Okay? Now, the analogy is, I think about higher voltage is when you scale things up, that's when you reach more people in more situations. That's how we can change the world. Okay, so that's law number one. Law number two is that this is an Anna Karenina problem. When I would talk to business people and government folks before I did research in this area, they all told me this is a silver bullet problem. What does that even mean, silver bullet problem? Anybody help me? I think they meant kind of you don't have Michael Jordan, you don't have LeBron, you don't have Giannis, right? You need that one big thing. That's, I think, what they meant. It's like a best shot problem. It's the opposite. An Anna Karenina problem, remember, why do I say Anna Karenina? What was the first line in Tolstoy's novel, Anna Karenina? Somebody help me out? Yes? Not bad, not bad. That's, I would say, I, I, all your students told me you're a tough grader, so I'm gonna give you a B minus. <laughs> uh, yes, of course. <laughs> I love her. She's, a, she's obviously a great teacher. 
What she really wanted to say was happy families are all alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Look, you have two kids, right? Six and ten. I have eight kids. There's always someone unhappy in my family. But Tolstoy has a dimensionality problem. And what that means here is there are an infinite number of ways that my own family goes astray. So this isn't really that helpful, is it? For Tolstoy, it's such a beautiful first line. It's like contentness. Here's my line. Scalable ideas are all alike. Each unscalable idea is unscalable in its own way. And I document the five vital signs that will make an idea scalable or unscalable. I don't have a dimensionality problem. In my research, every idea that fails on its merits will fail because of one or multiple of these five vital signs. That's chapter one, two, three, four, and five in the voltage effect. I lay out all five of the vital signs. And I'm gonna talk about a few of those now. The back half of the book uses what I call four little behavioral economic secrets. This is to run your life and run your organization. These are things like understand incentives. So all of you said you've taken an Uber or Lyft in the past five years. Let me ask you, how many of you tip your driver every time? Raise your hand. Okay. This is an incredible group. Either you are an incredible lying group or you're an incredibly generous group. Because only 1% of people tip on every trip. 1%. And guess what? Three out of five people never, ever tip. But guess what happens when I take those three out of five people out of Uber and put them in a yellow cab and then they settle up face to face at the end of the trip? How many of those who never tip on Uber, how many of them tip now when you have to do it face to face? 90, 95%. Social norms are important. Social pressure matters, social image matters. Okay, you change those, those are very important scalable incentives. Economists are not all about prices. You know, I got criticized last night for bringing extrinsic incentives into early childhood. If the child or the family does not have intrinsic incentives, you just try to teach it, try to make sure they have it, but if they don't, you don't forget about them. Use other kinds of incentives that can help that family. That's the way I think about it. Okay? It doesn't mean you give up on intrinsic motivation. That's kind of the back half of the book. We talk about incentives, talk about marginal thinking, which you talked about today in class, which is fun. I talk about quitting. We don't quit enough. Okay, we can talk about that in the Q&A, why I argue that. And I also talk about culture. I didn't appreciate culture until I lived at Uber and Lyft. Okay, then I really appreciated culture. And we can talk about that as well. But what I want to do is I want to focus for the next few slides on chapters one through five. And then I'll just conclude and we can have a QA. Are we doing okay on time? We're doing all right. I know Jim went for two hours, but I don't think the crowd likes me that much. Jim is Jim, John is John, right? Oh, if it's earlier, exactly. That's exactly right. That's one of the that's a great great insight because in the tipping paper, there are three bins about to try to explain tipping. One bin is the quality of the ride. You know, if you go really fast, like you said, that really hurts tipping. But if you get there on time without speeding, it helps tipping. If you have like a really quick stop or a jackknife start, that all hurts tipping, but it's only tiny. Service quality does not change with tipping. Everyone argues tipping uh, really increases service quality. It's not true in our day. So the quality of the service didn't really matter that much. The quality of the driver doesn't really matter that much either. The big effect was the person in the back seat. There's what's called a person fixed effect. And regardless of what they get, they're good tippers. And these other people are just always bad tippers. So it's really about the person, not the driver, not the trip quality. In, in, in our Uber data, at least, it's kind of interesting. Okay, let's talk about some of these vital signs. Vital sign number one, and it sort of came up last night, is the, is the chair of the psychology department in here? He's sick, that's, that's the old story. He his dog, he ate the book, so he couldn't read it. The chair is sick, I totally get it. The president's sick too? Yeah. Dog ate my homework. 
Um, no, no, of course he's okay. Yeah, you can just say I'm, I'm joking, okay? So you can see my personality. The first one is called false positives. And there are a lot of different ways to control false positives, which I talked about last night. One is control of alpha. The second one is human error. And the third one is human fraud. Okay, we, we won't go over all that stuff. But I talk about Hillary Clinton in chapter one. Okay, I talk about Nancy Reagan in chapter one. In the mid 80s, what was Nancy Reagan going after? Drugs. Just say no. I went through that program. Did anyone else in the room go through the program? The DARE program. Okay, remember they walked in to your high school and they said, if you use drugs, your brain will shrink, your private parts will shrink, don't use drugs. I looked at my teacher, I think it was like Riley McCormick at Sun Prairie High School, and I said, there's no way this is perky. This social inoculation program, no way. He looked back at me and said, John, they said they have data. For the book in chapter one, behind the question marks, I went and looked at the data. He was right. She based those arguments in the entire D.A.R.E. program on a great experiment from Honolulu. It had 1,777 kids. It had signals to work. But instead of trying to replicate it and make sure it works, they ran with it. 30 million people have now gone through that program. And I'm here to tell you it's simply a false positive. Because they weren't getting signal, then they went back and tried it again in Honolulu, tried it in LA, Atlanta, zero result, zero result, zero result. Now I'm gonna put a, a footnote here. The first week my book came out, guess who called me? The DARE program. They said, Professor Liss, love the book. But we just have a problem with it. I said, okay, what's that? They said, we're still doing the D.A.R.E. program today. <laughs> and we don't think you were fair to us. I said, did I say anything wrong? They said, no. But they said, you left out something. We changed the program. It works now. I said, look, I have high aspirations for this book. We didn't print that many copies. We'll get to version two, version three. Send me the data. I will gladly add on a few pages to chapter one, talking about your new program. We are now in edition four of the voltage effect. And I still have not received the data from there. So if you know who they are, tell them to send me the data. I promise I'll analyze it, we'll look at the experiments, and we'll see if it works, okay? That's really what chapter one is about, false positives. The government makes us air all the time. Chapter two is about know your audience. This is about extensive market, so to speak, okay? Now here, what's interesting is think about Uber apologies. Let's go back to that example. You might ask, well, who's impacted the most? You might ask, does it work for one group better than another? So one simple heterogeneity cut would look at things like light users, new users, and heavy users. And here's what you find in the data. That apologies idea really kind of only works for the light users, not the heavy users. In fact, it's a complete waste of money for the heavy users. So you, you can scale that idea, but scale it to the people it works for, and then come up with a better idea for the people who it's not working for, so they can be made better off. Okay? It's also the same thing in Uber Pool versus Uber. The idea works a lot better for people who use Uber Pool. Okay, it's another kind of heterogeneity. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about market and heterogeneity. Talk about this guy for a minute. This is a paper with Alec, Alec Brandon. And I apologize again, I left Alec out of version number one, and I was very sorry about that, but he was in two, three, and four now. Okay, so Alec's back in the business. <laughs> Should be, he's co-op. Okay. 
Who in the world's that dude? Don't let me down. That's Commander Spock. <laughs> That's Commander Spock. We're talking about DNA makeup of ideas. What, what's that dude's DNA? Anybody remember? I mean, you did the, the crazy fingers. I don't remember. He was Vulcan. Half Vulcan. Oh. <laughs> half Vulcan. Half Beloit economist. <laughs> that dude never gets it wrong. Ever. Well, footnote, once every seven years, right? That's it's a Vulcan story. Okay, that's good. Commander Spock, pretty good. What in the world is that thing next to him? That is smart technology in the form of a smart thermostat. Anybody have one of those in their home? <laughs> Does it work? All right, let me talk about how it works. When this innovation came out, the engineers estimated that we would take a chunk out of the climate change problem that was caused by households, simply by that smart technology. The engineers estimated that in the Petri dish. So Alec and I and a few others, Chris Platt, Mike Price, Rob Metcalf, I think I have other co-authors, we gave it a go. Let's test it. We went to California and got a few hundred households who wanted some smart thermostats in their home. We randomly sent half of them a new and free smart thermostat, and the other half we held them back. And then we watched them, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, and we measured how much did they save. How much do you think they saved because of that smart technology? You just said your family saves a lot. Now you're saying nothing. What does works mean? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> See that? It says works, but I can adjust it. <laughs> you can adjust the things that were in the 50s, too. <laughs> what? What do you think our estimate is, our best estimate of this technology? Zero. A really tight zero. Why is it zero? Here's why. Because you know who the real consumers are? The real American households? That guy. <laughs> you know what that guy does? He did exactly what I did when I got one of these bits of technology in my home. We talked about Dana Wednesday night. We get this technology in our home. Dana gets the, the user manual. She throws it to me. She says, you take care of it. I said, honey, I'll handle it. I got this. It's 28 pages, all of your ages. The writing just got small. So I looked at it, looked at it, tossed it to the side, and said, I got this. <laughs> and guess what I did? I went in and fiddled with it, just like you did. <laughs> guess what the customers in California did? They went in exactly like me, so I'm not saying I'm any better than Homer Simpson or these California households, and they fiddled with the defaults. They fiddled with the presets. And in our experiment, we could measure that. I think it was something like they did two fiddles a day right when they got it, and they fiddled enough to undo all the good stuff. It's all about extent of market in chapter two. Okay? Chapter three. Is it the chef, or is it the ingredients? We all know this story, right? We all know the restaurant that's killing it. And they have one site and they have like a million dollars in EBITDA. And they're like, why not have five restaurants? Why not 10? Why not 50? $50 million in EBITDA and a little bit of savings on the supply side called economies of scale. We're really in business. So they give it a go. They give it a go and they try to scale. 
I'm here to tell you that if the initial success is due to a unique chef, it will never scale. Humans have a really hard time scaling. Unique humans don't scale. You can try to systematize it. That's your best shot. Think about Uber and Lyft. If Uber and Lyft needed Danica Patrick and Michael Schumacher as drivers, how would that scale? Not very well. But people like me could drive. A lot of people like me are around. Okay, but the next step, it still really hasn't scaled. That idea will work when autonomous comes. That's where that business model is. It's the same question here. If the initial success of the restaurant was based on ingredients, and those ingredients are available at scale, you got a shot. You still have to execute, but at least you have a shot because the necessary inputs are available at scale. That's what chapter three is about. Chapter three urges academics to change around their research approach. In this chapter, this is where I take on academics like me, like my test self. Because remember what I said earlier. All of you should be thinking, John, these field experiments sound really cool. But you guys have been at it for a lot of years. Have we made a dent in poverty alleviation, climate, gender pay gaps, discrimination, etc.? No, not really. And the reason why is because we're answering the question of, can I put together a program that has a huge treatment effect in the Petri dish? And then we write it up and we get the headlines because we have an intervention that has a big treatment effect. That is an efficacy test. But when we write it up as an efficacy test, we forget to tell everyone else it was an efficacy test. And we haven't given the policymakers what they really need, which is, Let's test the idea on its merits, on its flaws, that it will face at scale. It's what I call policy-based evidence. We need to create more policy-based evidence to make sure, as social scientists, we're really helping. So that's something I talk about in Chapter 3 called Option C. Okay, now what do I mean by that is we all hear about A-B testing and do A-B tests. It's an experiment. A, B test is A is the control, B is the best stuff, the best idea we have. What I'm saying is, that's fine, do that. But also do option C, which is bring in the warts that you're gonna face at scale and still see if your idea works. That's like the policy making arm of an experiment, okay? And if you think about it, the evidence that we talked about before, I'm really talking about on the one hand situational features. Remember I talked about higher VOTs in peak commuting times or locations before outside options? So if you want to scale it somewhere and you want to talk about walk and save, wait and save, the features of the market will determine where and when it's going to work, the idea. We have that information using machine learning from step one. Okay, so that's what I talk about in chapter three. Chapter four, spillovers. Now, spillovers are really a kind of an interesting area because they're so rich. Spill, I, I document four different types of spillovers in chapter four. And the first actually starts with Ralph Nader. Anyone in the room read Ralph Nader's book from 1965? Anybody ever heard of Ralph Nader? Okay. He wrote this scathing book in 1965 on highway safety. It was taking the federal government to task. Best seller. 1968 rolls around, the federal government makes every new automobile install a seatbelt. So the young people are like probably wondering, these are cave people days, it's true. Before 1968, we were driving around, I was born in 1968, but you get the point, and we were driving around with no seatbelts in cars. 1968, every new automobile, mandatory seatbelt. Fast forward to 1975, 
there was a guy named Sam Peltzman. He estimates how many lives were saved because of the seatbelt law. Guess what he estimates? Zero. You can say, well, what happened here? What's going on here? A behavioral spillover happened. The people who were wearing the seatbelts drove more aggressively. They didn't die more often because they had a seatbelt on. But guess who died more often? The people who were driving 1965 cars, 1966 cars, 67 cars, who weren't in seatbelts. That's become known as a pelts medicine. That's one kind of spillover, a behavioral spillover. Another kind of spillover happened to me when I was chief economist at Uber. How many of you remember the hashtag delete Uber campaign? Anybody remember that? Okay. You know why that started? You know that story? January 27th, Saturday evening, 2017, President Trump makes an executive order on immigration. Anybody remember what happened in that executive order? A lot of America went nuts. They did not like that executive order. The taxi cab drivers around JFK Airport decided to go on strike. Whenever something like that happens in a market, Uber never wants to feel like they're gouging people, so they turned off search. The taxi cab drivers thought that Uber turned off search because they were trying to break up the strike. That's when the driver went nuts and said, blankety blank, Travis Kalanick and Uber, hashtag delete Uber. That tweet fundamentally changed the rideshare market as we know it. That Saturday, we had about 95% of market share in North America at Uber. Lyft was waving the white flag. They were dead. In nearly every market, they were dead. Overnight, they went to 30% market share because of the shenanigans that were happening at Uber at the time. So Travis came to my team. My team was called Ubernomics at Uber. Travis came and said, John, your job is to get the drivers back. Get them back engaged. What are your ideas? What do you think my ideas are going to be as an economist? Right? I said we should introduce tipping in the app. I went door to door with a few executive friends. All the execs said no right away. Uber doesn't have tipping in the app, and we're never going to. I got a bunch of data that showed that customers were getting sick of the tin can being in the back seat. And drivers didn't really like it that much either. Drivers wanted tipping, customers wanted tipping. Door to door, I won that battle at Uber. When you win a battle like that at Uber, guess what the booty is? More work. More work. And guess what though, this is fun work because I get to roll out tipping is a nationwide field experiment on Uber. I like that kind of work. Okay, so what did we do? We did a bunch of tests. Presets, stars. You know, when you can give the driver a star, you tip a lot less than if we take the stars away. Because you substitute your niceties to the driver by giving them five stars and then stiff them. That happened, that's a fact. Positive economics. But what I was most interested in is the economics of generosity and what we can learn about tipping and also scaling. So we gave this a go this summer of 2017 in the Chicago market. I pulled out 5% of drivers randomly and said, you 5% can receive tips. The rest of the drivers could not receive tips. I wanted to see what the effect of receiving tips was on trip quality, labor supply, and earnings. But I found kind of two fascinating things. One, drivers made more money who were receiving tips. And two, they worked more. And they really liked it. They were satisfied more with their job. 
I look good. But guess what happened that October, three or four months later, when we rolled it out to all drivers in Chicago? They all worked more, new drivers came in, the spillovers were so great that we undid the entire wage effect that we observed in the summer. Pre and post tipping, drivers made the exact same amount of money per hour. It's just that they worked a little bit more and they drove around with an empty car more often. That idea did not scale because of spillovers. And it's an economics 101 result that the labor supply curve shifted out and undid all the good stuff. Okay, these kinds of spillovers matter for ideas. Fifth one I'm gonna leave behind closed doors. You know I'm a Chicago economist. The first four doors are demand side. What do you think door five's gonna be? Supply side. Okay, so we can leave that on the sidelines. I want to close down and take some, take some questions. The ML here that we're talking about is a machine learning or AI approach to learn about various features and help us understand science better. Now what I did mention along the way is that I think AI and ML has its flaws. I'm not going to stand up here and say everything's rosy. But the nice features here is that once unscalable ideas might now be scalable because of technology. Cities that were once viewed as places where a great firm just can't grow. Remember Nevada tried this, Vegas tried this. People said, you gotta, you gotta be in Silicon Valley, otherwise you can't get the workers. Work from home, virtual, and ML and AI give these new locations a shot. And they put a whole different pattern of cities who have a shot to be very viable economically. So it's not only ideas, but it's locations that can change. Now, once you have an idea that scales, of course, ML and behavioral economics are complements. They work together, and I've highlighted three particular areas that we've been able to leverage treatment effect identification, architectural nudges, and of course, heterogeneity. Okay? So I'm going to stop there, and I want to announce the winners, and then I'm going to take any questions that you have. So thanks so much for your attention. And Al and Sal, do we have names of winners? You want, you want me to read them? Absolutely. Okay, but stop right there and keep looking. But what invariably happened here is a lot of people were like you, Edward. A lot of people guessed 33. Edward, why did a lot of people guess 33? Why did you guess 33? Okay. What did he just say about all of you? He said all of you are just going to answer randomly. Like a monkey, right? Randomly. Is that what you really think about your classmates? Because I think they're pretty smart. So Edward's saying, look, everyone else is just going to answer randomly. So they're going to average 50. Pretty good. You can take the mid-range of 1 to 100. Edward gets an A for that. But what he thinks about all of us, well, you're not invited to the party tonight or tomorrow night, right? This isn't, this isn't going to work. Because he thinks we're all just answering randomly, that we don't get it. So he said 33, because 33 is two-thirds of 50. But there are a lot of you who also said 22. <laughs> you said 22. Matt, why did you say 22? Uh, well, not bad, not okay. <laughs> Some people said 22 because they thought there are a lot of Edwards in the room. There are a lot of these Edwards in the room who think everyone else is random. And I'm going to be one step in front of Edward. Two-thirds of 33? That's your baseball number. Double deuce. 22. That's second-order thinking. And then the third-order people, I think they're going to, unlike the baseball thing, Matt, they're going to think iteratively and say, a lot of these smarties in here, these are smart colleagues. 
They're going to say 22. So what am I going to say? 15. My guess is that the average was around 27, the winning number. I'm just going to guess is 27. How close was I? The, the winner guessed 25. Uh, yes. the, the, Can you not the equilibrium yet? Who, who won? Who guessed 25? Gregory Nelson. Gregory oh, Nelson gave us the Hello! <laughs> Give him whichever size fits him, and then whoever got the equilibrium is going to get the other one. Greg Nelson, congratulations. Let's talk about the equilibrium. Does that mean 25 is the equilibrium? No. Because if everyone in the room guessed 25, that means we all have an equal chance of winning, right? So if everyone else says 25, what should you do? 24. Then what happens? You win with certainty. So you don't want to move, but if you do 24 and everyone else does 25, do they want to stay the same? You don't want to stay the same, right? You want to go down to 23, then 22, then all the way down, where do you stop? One. Once everyone guesses one, nobody has an incentive to change. That's equilibrium. My guess is there were several people who got it, because this is a pretty smart group. But we chose one of you at random, since I've given away like 13 t-shirts this week, and I'm out of money in, in t-shirts. Although you can go to a store, but there's no demand, so they won't be there. As I said before, Al, who is the smart equilibrium winner? The smart and lucky equilibrium winner is uh, Ellie Anderberger. <laughs> Ellie! So at the, a lot of people are wearing the, the shirt. At the end of all this, I would love it if you could come up and put the voltage effect t-shirt on and we can take a group picture of high voltage, okay? So I appreciate all of you playing along and I'll take any questions that you have. Let's go ahead. Uh, when they did the DARE program when you were younger, did they bring out the horrible hard up tape loans and then <laughs> No, that's but that they, might have got me. That's what they did when I was young. Woo. They got me. They got you. That, that's like, look, um, there are a lot of interesting studies on how to get people to quit smoking. And prices work very well. It's taxes. People have, you know, an elasticity of like 0.4. But you know what works really well are the graphic health ones. And the emphysema and showing a baby. So I helped Australia uh, lower the smoking incidence. And those were the ones that had a pretty huge effect consistently, and so did prices. So, yeah, they didn't do that when I was in high school. You know, they just talked about private parts of brains. And I was like, this is kind of crazy this year. Now, let me be clear. Nancy Reagan is, I, I do not at all mean to criticize her. She was the nicest person in the world. When I worked in the White House, she would bring us in hot chocolate chip cookies all the time. She really wanted to help. You can argue about whether she was misguided with the drug thing and say, well, she shouldn't have done that. That was, that was, the time, that was a sign of the times in the 80s. And a lot of people thought that. So don't get caught up in the attribution bias error. Attribution bias is we, we always say if the person did that activity, it's completely on them. Try to understand the context around what they were doing as well. And, and put those two together when you make inference. Okay, but I, did that get you the, the pig stuff? That yeah. really, I'm not using drugs. Okay, very good. You, didn't t you did not take off your sweatshirt. <laughs> there, there are no safety schools allowed in here. Okay. If you don't get in Beloy College, you go to your safety school, stand by. All right, I hear you. Uh, okay, so my question is that, is that uh, when, did, when you gave out the um, experiments of Sally's and Jane. I, I thought of an advertisement from Domino's where they promised um, a faster delivery at areas where road is hasn't been fixed, and they gave out money incentive to fix the road, and the, 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 the delivery time increased, like the faster delivery time. Yeah. Therefore, leads to a um, increase in revenue. So, why you what do you think? of the, the thing that needs to be fixed here in case of Sally and Jane 
because they have the same uh, starting point destination, but the roads are different. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, this was a really weak experiment in that there are a lot of things that could cause a bad trip. There could have been an accident. There could have been a wrong turn. There could have been bad weather. There could have been a lot of different things. This is just lumping them all together and saying, let's look at the deep left tail, the two and a half percent worst bad trips, and see how they affect revenue. In that world, you're throwing a lot of cases in there where the rider's gonna be, I understand, but you still get five to 10 percent of revenue loss. Now, in our experiment, we simply did the, like, the weakest form. A better form, which it iterated to, were the drivers wanted to apologize themselves, and especially when they made an error. And then they would say, I really want to send them a, a story. And then they felt better, and the, and the customer felt better, and then it was more targeted. But when you try something for the first time, I think you want to try it in general, and then you refine it using approaches to make a better product. And that's exactly what that product turned out to be. It's still an Uber, it's an Uber Eats, and it's a Lyft now. So if any of you received that apology in the $5, you can thank me. <laughs> that's completely my product, Uber apologies and Lyft apologies. Now, you don't blame me for the tipping thing, okay? But the VOT thing, same, same deal. I like these because they're products that enhance the, the space for customers. I believe that choice is good for customers in more product variety. And then if you have a big enough, um, let's say, economies of scale, you can pass along some of those savings to the customers too. Okay, those are the win-win things that I like. Okay, thanks for your question. You gonna go to River? A river runs through it. Hello. Best Hi. name in the world, River. Uh, At least I, your parents didn't name you after a mass murderer. I mean, I actually have met a lot of River, uh, I think like three or four, um, and they're all male, so I'm not surprised that I'm the only female River that I've known. But. Oh, really? Yeah. Very good. Very good. So, uh, my question is, so you say that you want to scale up the audience of this book from not just economic, but Well, it's not just the two people who read my academic papers, <laughs> not the three, because Al read one of them. I would like more, like my dad and all of you, to take a look at it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you want to scale it up to the general population yes. that may not know all the economics terms, right? Yes. But as a person who enjoy a lot of math in yeah. economics, I and I talk around with other people about this, and we all really miss some, you know, some data or some table or some functions in there. Yeah. And you know, this is an effective scaling. And so, what is your thought on the Absolutely. back end? Is it what you expect to see? Oh, I, I think you should understand product differentiation. And if you want to see the math and the equations and the theory and the data, I have 24 papers on scaling that form the basis of that book. That book is based on science that I deliver. So that's the market for you. You should go to RepEc, increase my downloads of abstracts and, and papers, and there's one called The Science of Using Science. It's published in the International Economic Review a few years ago. Download it, you're gonna get plenty of math, and you're gonna see theories in their greatest form. And then go ahead to the Journal of Economic Perspectives, go ahead to the other 22, and that's for you. That's a product that you should read if you're interested in scale. Great, I've got that for you. When you want to make change, I think it's good to differentiate your product space. So then people who like one thing can read it, people who like another thing can read it. Nobody has an excuse now, because I have the math, I have the data, I have the economies. You want that, go get it. But I also took all that out and created books. In particular, one voltage effect book. So another book that we edited is on scaling of early childhood policies. That I edited with my wife Dana Suskin and our colleague uh, Lawrence Lee. So what that is is an edited book that has 22 different people write about what they've learned in early childhood on scaling. You could have done that in any space. We have a paper on what have we learned from the medical community on scaling. That's in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, and it's pretty, uh, I would say, approachable. And it, it has some intuitions and economies in there. So I think there's some, hopefully there's something for everything here. Yeah. 
Okay? So basically, if you didn't hear a question, it was basically, I don't want to read your book because it's schlock and give me the real stuff. The Fair River? That's not what she said, though. Was it? I mean, I didn't hear that. Maybe I have a thin skin, but that's not what I heard. She should not read the Bulger effect. It's tri too trivial for her. We got some good stuff coming. I take a look at the IER proof, proof theorem, proof theorem, proof theorem. Corollary, corollary. Uh, hello. Um, so obviously you mentioned that there are um, that a ML and AI aren't perfect. I was wondering what are the downsides of ML and AI in your line of work, and um, apart from spillovers or uh, but yeah. Look, look, I think when you take advantage of people, and I think last night, I think that's where philosophers can really help us, um, and they can help give us insights about what can go amok, and give us insights about where we should look. Um, I'm not going to stand up here and say all of this technology is great. I'm not going to stand up here and say all this technology is terrible. Uh, but I do think there's going to be a middling point where technology can really help us. But we have to be super careful. I think that's the main message last night, uh, which was right, and I agree with that. And I think there are many ways it has gone amok. In many ways that's probably gone amok that we don't even know about. It. And you can see it, how in the wrong, quote, wrong hands, how it can be. Uh, look at what Facebook's gone through. Look at what Twitter's gone through. The fact that our democracy <coughs> has a shot to be significantly compromised because of the shenanigans that were happening on things like Facebook and in other places, that's real. It's happening in our lives. Um, and I, I think we need to understand those, and we don't understand them that well. We have some theories. You know, we have some toxicity stuff that goes on, but. Um, these are new grounds, and they're new important grounds that are going to affect humanity. So this, 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 this discussion is much more than can I get more people to take an Uber, right? That discussion's a pretty deep one, and the fun aspect of last night is we started to go there a bit. And the people around campus, I'll be totally honest with you, the deepest thinkers around campus on these issues are the philosophers. And it's on every campus like that. And I think that's a real comparative advantage that schools like Chicago and Boy College have. You can have these great deep thinkers on these really important issues. And they have a place at the table and we can discuss them. Oh, go ahead. Oh, he's got it. No, go ahead, raise your hand again. Don't be shy. He's been so good, I saw him around campus and he always says hi to me. <laughs> Yeah, I've been, I, so it's like a two-part question. So my sure. first segment of it was, how did you come up with tipping for Uber? Where did that thought come from to try it? Like, that's incredibly not novel at all. Lyft, when Lyft started, they had tipping the whole time. The drivers wanted tipping. A lot of customers wanted tipping. That's not even novel. What was novel about it, in a way, was how I got the job done. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. It has tipping and drivers. It's, it's around, uh, look, the average tip conditional on tipping is $3.31. It is, it is real money. A lot of drivers are helped. Now, so it wasn't novel, really. The novel part, I think, was rolling it out as an experiment in trying to learn about these aspects of generosity and about the economics of tipping. I think that was a more novel part, but just having the idea of we should put tipping in there, that's not. Like, everyone could have said that. Yeah. But go ahead, second question. So my second question is, is $5 enough to cop a t-shirt? And if not, what is the price of elasticity? Oh, I love it, I love it. <laughs> I would love to have a t-shirt for you because you know I like you. And you know every time I walked around the corner, you had a big smile today and you were so nice. You've been so nice to me. Um, but there could be a market. There could be a person in this room who hates their t-shirt and is willing to sell it. For five dollars, absolutely, absolutely. Is five dollars your price? Because I'm going to be allocatively efficient. You can talk afterwards. You might have a shot. Whoever leaves with it, please come up here and have it on for our picture. And you are not allowed in the picture because you do not want my T-shirt. My heart is broken. Next question. Like we used to say in the White House. Next question. Hello. Hey. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask, like, how apologies affected in the competition of different companies of the same brand 
and like imagine if we have like order delivering company yeah. and like one of the company like ah, it's a real incident because a lot of competition between the order delivering company nowadays and one of the companies i know they started a new campaign like if anything bad happened with their food while delivering they will be giving you another food so like immediately i saw them like one month before and after i saw them like after one month they like uh, their market share increased like like exponentially yeah like by giving them the another food in place of the previous food yeah yeah it's a great question so i don't know if any of you listen to free economics radio or free economics podcast but stephen levitt and stephen duffner have, have really created a set of uh, public goods that are both entertaining and informative. So Stephen Dubner does a lot of these free economics podcasts, and, and we did a podcast on the economics of apologies. So on that podcast, I distinctly remember Stephen asking me that question. And I said, a lot of times when people ask me questions like that, I go to extremes. So what I did here is I said, you know, I can remember back when I worked in the White House, that there was one person in the White House who would never, ever apologize. It was President Bush. And even though behind closed doors, he would say, I messed up. All of his advisors would say, don't go apologize, don't say that. Because it's reputation building. And they knew that the next election or the midterms or whatever, they're gonna keep playing, I messed up, I messed up, I messed up. And they wouldn't even have to fake it, right? because it would be real. So there are some entities that strategically, it just makes sense to withhold apologies. A place like Uber, you can see it worked for the new people and the light users. The users who use a lot, kind of like, I, I know how Uber is. I, I plug my nose when I get in the back of the car. I know they're going to mess up all the time. Don't give me your nonsense. Um, I don't want to hear it. And that's what it is in the data. Now, I think you can talk about different firms in different spaces where it's like, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But that's where the science comes in, doesn't it? I've given you a platform to try it, and you can see if it works for your firm, in your organization, if it's built on reputation, and that's important for people to come back and feel good about what's just happened. That's that reputation building third treatment that I talked about, the commitment tech thing. We're committed to that. Uh, that's one kind of firm, I think. You, you're probably, I don't know if you have a partner or a wife, but I mess up all the time. If I keep apologizing every day with like roses, good luck, right? It's not gonna work, it's gonna backfire eventually. And she'll just say, just stop messing up. And that's the answer, right? Just give a better service. But when you're so big, these bad things happen just by chance. Okay, but I, I, that's where I say, look, there are places where you can see and have strong intuitions, but you don't really know for sure if your gut feeling is right until you test it. And it's easy to test, right? So that would be my response. And, and we talk a lot about that in types of places where we think apologies could work in the podcast. Okay? You have a question? Bobo, oh, well, I think he's good. Are you good? Yeah, he says he's great. He says he feels good. He doesn't have a t-shirt, but he feels good. He heard the going rate might be five dollars and one cent. Is that where you're at right now, ma'am? What's your name? Ellie. Ellie. She's at 501 if you want that shirt. Are you willing to go higher? 502? I got 505. 505? <laughs> All right, quit! I like where we're going here, and all proceeds will go to the economics department. Uh, <laughs> experimental budget. I like it. I like it. Quint, I promise I will send you a t-shirt in the mail, and Rishi will get one too. I promise. So we, I don't, I don't want you to use all of your money tonight. Good luck having that happen, right? Uh, go ahead, sir. <laughs> uh, can you hear me clearly right now? I mean, Yo, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So uh, this summer I was working on like a. Uh, the bioinformatics team, so uh, we try to access like, some information data from like uh, the American patients about like, the re recovery process of like P of the patients. Yeah. So we so you, were you working in a hospital or in a post surgery uh, or post Actually, we work. I work for like University of Tokyo. So okay. Yeah. Some like, so, so post op type stuff, post surgery, looking at recovery time. Yeah. 
So uh, yeah, we recognize that I have my bias of the data. So I, uh, because we cannot access the information from my like, homeless people and also like mm -hmm. undocu undocumented citizens, they are kind of like underrepresented in Latin America. So uh, like we are trying to find like ways that we can like access this group of people because they like also produce a lot of like bad healthcare income, but, like outcome. So like. If you, like, you are in this kind of situation, how can you be able to like, suggest some uh, solution? Yeah, 100%. It's a good question. So the way I want you to think about the empirical method is, let's just talk about experiments, since that's what we're talking about today. You have a group of people, and you randomize, say, people into treatment and control. You either get an apology or you don't, for example. You can establish causality with that group. Okay? Full stop. It's called internal validity. But where you're going is, John, how can I generalize that result from your group to another group? Now the way I think about that is if you have some overlap in your sample to that group of, like homelessness, you likely won't. You might have no information at all. But a lot of cases there's some overlap in your sample. And then you can try to reweight things to learn about the sample that's not as represented in your group, but is kind of represented. Now, in the cases where there's no representation at all, you can start by saying, okay, does economic theory help us? So I, I gave a lot of those reasons in those five ways that VOT change. So even though there might not be a city in my value of time study, I can set those variables at levels of the new city and then I can try to make a prediction of how it will go over to that new city based on how those other five variables are situated. That, that's one way to do it. And that's now using theory and data to try to generalize. It's not perfect because to be perfect, you have to get data from that group. And if you can't get that group, you can't get that group. But there are specific ways that you can try to use economics and forecasting to do that. Okay? That's a good question, though, important question. It's almost nine, so um, maybe just one last question and then we call it a night. He has a question, but before he, right over here, uh, is it right over here? He has a question. But before he asks, I want to go back to the auction. Uh, <laughs> and we have quit out, so I think we we're at like $7.50. Can you do another experiment? Might be. <laughs> Might be. Indulge me and I'll find out. Um, we're at like seven dollars. Or it's not, but we took quid out of the bid. Oh, uh, well, uh, capital You have to talk to the seller. I don't know. You have the Zenmo or Velmo or whatever that thing's called. Face chat. I don't know how you guys transfer money. Like I have no idea. I don't know what they're called. I mean, all these kids have all these fancy things these days. Um, do you take Velmo or whatever it is? You'll figure it out. I've noticed that. Lots of trust. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> all right, okay, should we get to ask the last question? All right. Uh, so I'll finish my question this morning. Um, yes, that's awesome. So in chapter four, I think you mentioned uh, an experiment uh, where, uh, like baseball kids do the fun thing, right? That's right. Yeah, and you mix the ten dollars kids and the fifteen dollars kids. Some in people the first can time. see the wages of others, uh -huh. and then we can look at their effort and how much money they raise. That's correct. Yeah, and what the second, that, what happened in that van? Uh, spillovers. So uh, the ten dollars kids know that they. Yeah, they are paid lower, so I'm checking out, dude. <laughs> hey, coach, I'm out. Yeah. And the second summer, you hire just the fifteen dollars kids, and the third now summer we can start to be a business, right? Start yeah. to, we learn from data. Maybe we can start to raise some more money for the charity. That's pretty cool stuff. Using science can make the world a better place. Yeah. And the third summer, you only hire the ten dollars kids, yeah. right? Why pay more when we don't have to, right? Let's get, raise more money for the boys' uh, youth group. You so, with me or not? Yeah. Okay, I hear you. I like that shirt you wore today, by the way. Thank you. It's a good look for you. 
So my question is, uh, was the la the first summer the, a mistake, or yeah. was it intentional? I like to define it as a purposeful mistake. <laughs> and, and let me be very clear, I hate it when people say that. Because, you know, working at Walmart, a guy walks up, and I, I was angry. It wasn't Al. But uh, uh, a guy walks up and says, I did this. And I said, I can't believe you just did this. What is going on? He said, well, it was a purposeful mistake. <laughs> just admit it was a mistake. It's OK to make mistakes. You don't have to just justify. Purposeful mistake might be the worst oxymoron in the world, right? But just admit it. But this one, I, I hate to say it, it was a purposeful mistake. <laughs> uh, but thanks for your question. It's a really good question. And it, and it means you read the book, which warms my heart. I will tell you the hardest part about this journey is getting people to open your book. The hardest part about all of this is not writing a book. It takes time, but we're academics. We know how to write. It's a third different way to write, right? You write in kind of three ways. A popular book, textbook, and academic journal. It's, it's three very different ways to write, but they're all very fruitful and they're all done for a reason. But the hardest part about this is getting people to actually open the book. If you, you would not believe how many people have told me, and this happened with the y-axis too, where they would say something like, John, I got your book, I love it. I said, yeah, yeah, tell me about what you love about the book. And they said, well, it's sitting on my nightstand. And I read up to page 12. And it's just been just fascinating, riveting. I said, I put it next to the nightstand for you know, about three weeks ago. But I'll get back to it. That's like the worst compliment you can pay a guy in the world. John, I read it. I plugged my nose through 13 pages. And I put it on my nightstand, and I can't wait for the next book to come out because your book is going to get chewed up by Pepper or someone else. And then I'm, I'm just lost here. Right? That's like the worst. Don't say that to an author. Don't say, I got through 13 of 200 pages, but I love it. Riveting. Can't put it down. I get it. You don't like it, you don't like it. But don't like give me a pat on the back and say you actually like something. OK? I want to say thank you again for all of this. I love this community. This is a special group of both 94 faculty and 1,000 students. And this is a special city that Quint and others in the room are trying to make better. And it really is a special community of scholars and students. And thank you so much for opening up to me this week. It's really meant a lot to me. It's meant even more that we can engage in open debate. And you've actually looked at some of my work. And the students are getting it and arguing about it. That really warms my heart. So I said thanks a lot for all of this. And I really appreciate your time and consideration here this week. Thank you. About and if you have a voltage show. effect shirt, oh, get yeah. your batons up here. We're taking a picture. Now we also have um, the save the date card for next year after forum. So on the way out, grab one. Also books from last year after forum. Give us my grade. You have a match. Right. I'm not going to do it. 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 I